On the Aztec Sports Network, welcome to the Rocky Long Coaches Show, brought to you by Bank of California. Bank of California is proud to be the presenting sponsor of Aztec Football. San Diego County Toyota Dealers, we've got what it takes. Miller Lite, great beer, great responsibility. And by LG, you gave they right. It's all possible with LG. Now, it's the Aztec Coaches Show. Here's your host, John Cantera. And good evening and welcome to the Coach Rocky Long Show. John Cantera with you from now until 8 o'clock, breaking down the uh, previous ball game, San Diego State at North Carolina. The Aztecs have a bye this week. Their next uh, ball game will be coming up on Saturday, September 20th at Reeser Stadium against Mike Riley's Oregon State Beavers, who also have a bye this week. Uh, they uh, got out of there last uh, Saturday night at Aloha Stadium uh, by the skin of their teeth. Uh, Hawaii mounted a big rally, put 23 points on the board in the fourth quarter, and the uh, Beavers hung on 38-30. to They will take the field against the Aztecs on September 20th with a 2-0 and mark. We're joined right now by the head coach of San Diego State. Uh, of course, uh, a very difficult uh, loss. The Aztecs really, I thought, uh, outplayed the North Carolina uh, Tar Heels on that night, uh, but uh, the Tar Heels walked away with a 31-27 to victory over the Aztecs. The Aztecs now 1-1 one and one on the year, and they'll uh, work this week and get ready for the Oregon State Beavers uh, as we uh, work our way towards that September 20th date. We're joined right now by head coach Rocky Long of San Diego State, and Coach, that uh, you've been coaching a long time, and you've had ball games like that. But boy, you guys had those guys by the by the toe and just let them out, let them go. Well, Coach, it's good to be back on with you. I I agree. I, I thought we played uh, pretty well most of the game. Made a couple mistakes that were probably the difference. I mean, you can you can go on both sides of the ball. You know, you throw three interceptions, one return for a touchdown, one they kick a field goal. Uh, and then the interception at the end, or you can talk about the 91-yard touchdown pass when their wide receiver ran right by us, and uh, that got them back in the game quickly and didn't have to drive the ball. I mean, there, there's all kinds of reasons you lose those kind of games, but I was proud of the players the way they played. You know, I thought your team uh, physically uh, really held up uh, very well. North Carolina, they uh, they got hot there late in the ball game, were able to make some plays, and of course, it's been well documented about Quinn Kaler's struggles in that ball game. He ended up throwing three interceptions. That first went for a 100-yard return. But I wanted to ask you a little bit, just because a, a lot of people have asked me, they know that I do this show with you, and. You know, I think all of us, uh, you know, and you probably do the same when you're sitting at home, you're trying to call plays, and what would you do in that situation? And there were a couple of plays I wanted to ask you about, and, uh, you know, kind of explain what goes in and how the play call comes in, because I know it's hours and hours a film study, whether it be uh, the offensive coordinator and his staff or the defensive coordinator and his staff. But I wanted to ask you about two specific plays in the ball game on Saturday. Second quarter, first and goal at the North Carolina two-yard line. You guys decided to go with a stretch play to the right side. It went for a three-yard loss. In, in that situation, how about power football? It, or is that something you saw on tape where you thought you could uh, maybe uh, uh, attack an area that had been kind of weak in North Carolina's game the week before? We, we actually got into an unbalanced formation where we, we thought we had them outnumbered. Uh, we gave them a gap that they didn't really have anybody uh, assigned to, so they had to be able to defeat blocks and run inside out, which they did. We didn't do a very good job of blocking on that play. And they, uh, in fact, we missed the block on that play, and the guy penetrated the line of scrimmage. If we'd have made that one block, it probably would have scored, but that's easy to say. Uh, we missed the block. He got penetration and tackled the guy in the backfield. Um, they have a way when we got into power sets where they would get eight or nine guys in the box. And uh, they'd have, always have a guy that could not be blocked. And now that means the running back's got to make a miss or run over them. Uh, but we thought we had an advantage when we got into that formation because we gave them a gap they didn't have anybody assigned to. Okay, so that that probably as well answers my second question because I know uh, a lot of people were wondering. I'm sure that somebody asked you this question. I didn't hear it after the game, but I'm sure somebody said, hey, Coach, you had 30 seconds left. You had two timeouts. You're down 31-27. to 27. It's first and goal at the North Carolina three-yard line. 
Why go for a pass on that first down? Why not try to pound it in? So it was probably the same situation, right? Well, not not exactly, and and I and I because I I uh, really think that you understand these kind of things, being an old coach and everything. <laughs> Pe- people don't know how much thought goes into that. Uh, they got a player hurt, uh, so we had an injury timeout. Now we could run ten seconds off the clock if we would have been ahead, but obviously we didn't do that. So we had time to think about it and talk about it. And we didn't know if they were going to stack the line of scrimmage and make us throw it or if they were going to play uh, a base defense that would allow us to run it in there. And so we decided that you never know how many plays you're going to need to score. So we sat there and thought about it. And if we needed four plays to score, you throw a pass on first down. If the guy's not open, you throw it up in the stands. Now you've got three plays left that you can run or pass because you can always call a timeout after the play. So it made a lot of sense. to. We thought we had a pass that would work. It made a lot of sense to throw a pass first, talk to uh, Quinn about it, and if the guy's open, throw it to him. If it's not open, throw it up in the stands. And then we uh, throw an incomplete pass or a touchdown pass, and we got three plays with two timeouts. So there's always the threat of run or pass. And so in case we needed four plays, it was a simple decision to throw a pass on the first down. Uh, obviously, we didn't anticipate throwing an interception. So those kind, of quest- uh, those kind of strategies always come up into question. Hey, Coach, uh, offensively, I thought you guys really did some good things. I thought you played a heck of a game, quite frankly, and I thought you, you played well enough to, to win uh, a couple of big plays, definitely turn that ball game around like it does a lot of times. But offensively, uh, what letter grade would you give your offense for that performance? Well, you know, that, that's hard to do. Uh, because we talk around here, and, and for the last three years that I've been the head coach, uh, when we win the turnover ratio, we normally win the game. And when we lose the turnover ratio, we normally lose the game. So the emphasis all fall camp uh, was not to turn the ball over and cause turnovers. And so in the first game, uh, we played probably an inferior opponent, but it was one-to-one. We threw an interception, we got an interception. This game, they got three interceptions. We only returned one interception on them. So we lost the turnover ratio. Uh, So in past history around here, that means we didn't score very well. I mean, that that would be a D or an F. But if you talk about the way we moved the ball, the way we controlled the ball and controlled the the clock, uh, we had some big plays in the passing game. We had some big plays in the running game. I thought the offensive line blocked really, really well protected the passer pretty well uh you know that's a, that's probably an a or a b but uh, you can never give anybody an a or a b when you lose i thought your two running backs really ran well in that football game and even when there maybe wasn't a hole they tried to make a hole i, I thought both running backs played well and I, like i said i thought the offensive line blocked well and they got them a chance to get to the second level to the linebacker level and if the linebacker was in the proper position, as you said, they ran with some power and ran through them or over them or made a miss. And there was a couple of times where they made unbelievable nice cuts where the linebackers over-pursued. They cut back, hit a seam, and was in, they were in the secondary before the secondary guys hardly even knew it. Coach, let's talk a little bit about uh, Ezell Ruffin. I know he had surgery on Monday out uh, six to eight weeks after having a plate uh, putting that broken collarbone. And what specific play did he do it on? He did it on the best play of, of the game for him. He, it was the long pass that he split the two receivers, kind of like they did to us in zone coverage. It was zone coverage. He split the deep safety in the cornerback. And then Quinn made a beautiful throw right between them and dropped it right in his hands. Um, I thought he was going to score, but they ran him down and tackled him from behind. And when he hit the hit the ground, that's when he broke his collarbone. Where do you go from here at that wide receiver spot? Here's a guy that's done some fantastic stuff. He's got tremendous experience. He knows how to, to work with quarterbacks, work back to the ball. He knows how to read uh, zone defenses. Uh, uh, you can't replace him, but how, who's going to get the first opportunity? First opportunity is Larry Clark. He, he's the one that went in for Ezel when Ezel got hurt. Um, he's a talented young guy. He's about six foot two. He's a little over two hundred pounds. He runs fast, has good hands, but the experience factor is what people don't realize you miss. I mean, some of our re- young receivers in this game, including Larry. 
uh, ran the wrong adjustments uh, to the coverage. You know, you have several patterns that you adjust to the coverage that the other team plays. Uh, we had several plays where our receivers didn't get at the right depth in uh, certain zones. You know, all that hurts the quarterback. And Ezel, obviously the most experienced guy, he always made the right adjustments to the coverage he saw. He was always at the right depth, and it was a security blanket for our quarterback. Now, those young guys got to get a lot better, and they should because they're getting a lot more reps now. What was your overall uh, thought on the wide receivers? And uh, your tight end, big Robert Craighead, had a couple of catches. One of them was a circus catch. <laughs> Well, I, I thought the receivers played well. Other than the, you know, some of the assignment errors that we just uh, talked about, I thought they got open. I thought they caught the ball well. Eric Judge showed uh, his speed on the long down the sidelines catch for a touchdown. Uh, Craig Head has become quite the receiver in our offense, and as you said, he made a real nice catch down the middle of the field where he jumped up and took the ball away from him. And uh, he's also a great big guy that does a good job of blocking. So. I mean, there, there are far more positives to this game than any of the negatives. The biggest negative is we didn't win. Well, and uh, that's, you know, at the end of the year, they asked how many you got on the left side of the board and right side of the board. But did uh, did your players, you think, uh, did they prove something in themselves in that game? Well, I, I don't know I don't know if they did or not. I You know, I, I really believe going in the game we were as good as they were. And I think our players believe that too. Uh, now, when you think you're as good as someone, you have to go in and prove it. And maybe there was a little doubt. I don't know. I don't think so because all the way up until the last play of the game, I figured we were going to win the game. Uh, and I and I agree with you. I, I thought we outplayed them. Other than a couple big mistakes, we outplayed them for the entire game. So I, I think I think we went into the game confident. I don't think we surprised ourselves. Uh, but if if we did surprise ourselves in any sense, uh, that should be gone by the wayside now. But, Coach, is that what – when you get to a bowl game and, and two years ago you guys win the conference title, that breeds success. And that carries over, I think, uh, from one year to the next when you've got young guys that have gone through the program and they start really buying in and believing that you guys can beat anybody. Well, you're exactly right. And, and we've played some really good teams in the past where we've played them really, really well. And uh, we've won some of them. I mean, in the last couple, three years, we've beat two ranked teams. Now, they happen to be both in our conference, but one of them was ranked 19th, one of them was ranked 21st at the time we beat them. Uh, so I, I, don't think, I don't think our team fears anybody, and I think our team can compete with anybody. I wanted to ask you about the fullback position because I think Adam Roberts is doing fine and by no way, shape, or form am I uh, trying to move him out of the fullback position on your depth chart. But it looks like Dakota Gordon's doing a pretty good job. And is that something that could free up Adam to maybe play a little bit more where he played a year ago as a starter at tight end? No, you're exactly right. In fact, Adam has played some tight end in the first two games. Right. And we didn't know going in if Dakota Gordon was going to be the kind of fullback we needed, so that was the reason Adam Roberts was moved there in the first place. And Dakota Gordon is probably uh, the biggest surprise on our team. I mean, we mm. thought he had potential, but in the first two games he's really, really played well. He blocks well. He runs with the ball hard. He catches the ball well out of the backfield. I, I think it's going to free up Adam Roberts to do a lot more things in the slot or at tight end. Well, it also, I think, uh, allows Coach Toledo to, to be uh, even more imaginative. Well, I think, I think whenever you have a fullback and a guy that can catch the ball out of the backfield, it helps everything. Yeah, I thought Dakota really uh, did a nice job the other night. I kind of focused on that spot a little bit, three catchers and 42 yards. And uh, uh, you feel pretty good about him uh, in blitz pickup and situations like that? I, I think that uh, he blocks really, really well on the run. And obviously he's uh, he's not very tall, but he's a big, strong guy. So there's no fear factor whatsoever in blocking for the pass. Uh, he's a little uh, over aggressive in open space, if that makes sense. If a, if a uh, football player can be over aggressive, you know he wants to go knock him out instead <laughs> of just stay in front of him on pass protection. So sometimes when he's got a guy in the open area it's a little tough but he gets better and better every day hey let me ask you just because you know i'm watching the game on television and, and i don't know what what the the weather was like and of course you're going from uh, west coast to east coast did you think your team held up physically pretty good uh, through the four quarters back there yeah i, I think so i i don't think uh, i'll tell you that our offense did a great job of controlling the clock or controlling the time that they had it 
And even though they were hurry up and trying to snap the ball every 18 seconds or something, mm-hmm. I, I thought uh, condition-wise we held up pretty good. Uh, I thought that we got a little undisciplined on defense in the fourth quarter when we were rushing the passer. We got out of our pass rush lanes a couple times, and their quarterback, who's a good player, mm-hmm. did a nice job of scrambling and getting first downs and keeping the ball going that way. Uh, the coverage was pretty good. We tackled pretty good. Uh, the only bad pass play they had was the 91-yarder, and, and we were in good position there. He was just faster than we were. <laughs> well, uh, th- that guy, uh, once he got it, boy, he uh, flat out took off. He could run a little bit. Aztecs in that ball game actually outgained the Tar Heels, 509 total yards to 394. We're going to take our first time out. We'll come back. We are going to get to phone calls if you'd like to uh, check in tonight. Uh, San Diego, 866-405-1717. And just want to remind everyone that next week, Coach Long will be off. We will not have the Rocky Long Show next Wednesday night. But the following uh, Wednesday night, September 24th, we'll be back from 7 to 8 right here on ESPN 1700. And then our first show on the Mighty 1090 will be on October 1st. So uh, maybe uh, make a little note of that first show on the Mighty 1090, October 1st. And then the next Rocky Long Show will be on September 24th right here on ESPN uh, 1700. We'll take a quick timeout. Back with more with Coach Rocky Long. John Cantera, this is ESPN 1700. As we continue on the Coach Rocky Long Show, John Cantera with you at 8 o'clock tonight. Want to remind everyone, uh, Aztecs will be back home on September 27th when they uh, welcome conference rival UNLV. Kickoff yet to be determined. Of course, uh, waiting on uh, television on that one. But tickets for the game start at only $16 to purchase tickets. Give them a call at 619-283-SDSU, or you can log on to GoAztecs.com. And, Coach, let's talk about the defense a little bit. Uh, And let's start with the defensive line. Your overall thoughts on uh, how the guys played as a group, maybe uh, point out an individual or two. And also, how many defensive linemen did you play in the (laughs) ballgame? We we played – we we took eight. We played all eight of them. And – we were trying to keep them fresh because, like we talked earlier, they're a hurry-up offense, and they want to throw the ball rather than run it. I, I thought the defensive line um, played well. I, I thought I thought they controlled the running game. I thought we got a decent pass rush uh, for about three quarters of the game. A decent pass rush, uh, sending only four. Uh, we knocked three passes down, uh, and one of them was tipped and intercepted by another defensive lineman. Uh, that ended up being a touchdown for us. Uh, I think Alex Barrett, our nose guard, had a great game. He knocked two of the balls down, one that he tipped. Um, John Sanchez uh, intercepted it and ran it back. Uh, Sam Meredith played really well. Donna, Dontrell Onoa played pretty well. Um, you know, and we used a lot of guys. Uh, when we put the younger ones in there, they were full of, you know, they were full of vinegar. <laughs> they got after it, but uh, they made some assignment errors and. Some of our pass wrestling lanes late in, late in the game uh, was partly because we had some of the young guys in there. But they played pretty well. How about the linebacking core? Because that's been an area where you've been hit the hardest injury-wise. Well, uh, we got Josh Gavard back, who played half the game, and uh, Derek Largent played half the game. So that, that really helped. Uh, Calvin Munson has played really well for us so far. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't think we got the kind of pass rush that we needed when we blitzed them. I mean, I, I think the quarterback felt the pressure, uh, but we didn't hit him enough. Uh, I mean, we, we hit him several times, made him made some bad throws, but uh, to get him off their game, you have to hit him a few more times. You know what I took out of the game, and I want to get to the secondary here, but, I mean, you guys matched up with a team that came in ranked 21 in the country, and if somebody would have just walked in – middle of the second quarter, or maybe even in the first quarter for that matter, and they sat down and, you know, they knew nothing about either one of those teams. They were wearing uh, dark jerseys. The other team was wearing white jerseys. They wouldn't have known which team was ranked. And and the athleticism that over the last three or four years you and your staff have been able to to bring in is really, I think, very noticeable. Well, I I appreciate you saying that because I think it is too now. Um, we have gotten more athletic yearly, and we are playing some young guys that are second-year guys, and we're even playing some true freshmen that are longer, faster, uh, potentially better players than what we've played in in the past. 
But what they're doing is playing really, really hard and making uh, minor mistakes. And when you get in a close football game with a talented football team, a minor mistake or two is the difference in winning and losing. So I, I think the potential for this program is unbelievable because of the kind of players that are in our sophomore or redshirt freshman and our freshman class. Now our veterans who were recruited before our success, um, they're playing well too. And, and I think they're better players because of their maturity and their experience. But athletically, the younger guys, uh, have re- we've really upgraded our athleticism and we've upgraded our size and our length and all those sort of things too. Let's talk about the secondary. Now, you know, I don't uh, sit there with the end zone tape and, uh, you know, the, the little pointer and my uh, clicker going back and forth, but I thought J.J. Whitaker played a heck of a ball game from what I saw. J.J. played a great game, and that's, that's the life of a cornerback. I, I thought <laughs> that Monte Casey played a good game. I thought J.J. played a great game, uh, but the 91-yarder, was basically on him and Trey Lomax, who was the free safety at the time. And that same receiver had beaten J.J. on a, an out route earlier in the game, and all that J.J. did was stutter a little bit, kind of waiting for the out route, and the guy took off and we couldn't catch him. But that's the life of a cornerback. I mean, you can play a great game and then give up a long touchdown pass, and everybody wonders what – what you've been doing the whole game he made he made a lot of tackles he covered really really well uh, I thought both corners did and then we put a couple young corners in there and they weren't quite as good but they're going to be just as good someday and then our safeties played much much better than they did the first game first week um, Trey Lomax had a really good game I think he had double digit tackles uh, did a good job in coverage was in the deep middle on the long one and just got outrun. Uh, but overall, they made huge improvement. And probably about halfway through the season, they'll really be good. You know, I saw Trey Lomax play safety as a, um, a junior at Mira Mesa. And then as a senior, he played a lot of quarterback and then stick him at running back. And he'd still play safety. But just watching him on defense, I thought he was, you know, very natural on defense. And he seemed to have a pretty good uh, vision out on the field. You're right. He's, uh, he's got what we say great instincts. I mean, he, he diagnoses plays well and is normally in the right place at the right time. Um, and you – can't coach this out of somebody, but he's one of those guys that take chances. And when he takes chances, he's right most of the time. So he, so he ends up making a lot of really good plays. Now, in that same attitude, when you take chances, you're going to give up a play now and then. You just have to make sure you make more than you give up. <laughs> Very well put. Uh, Donnie Hageman, uh, people are starting to figure out who this guy is. Boy, he's kicking the ball great, isn't he? I think that was the for two weeks in a row. That was the most uh, uh, enjoyable thing to watch uh, from our sidelines. I, I thought Joel Lisi did a great job of punting. I thought our players really covered the punts well because they had an All-American punt returner back there that has returned six uh, punts for touchdowns in a year and a half. Um, but our field goals, being able to put a field goal kicker in there and have a good idea that. You're going to make a 48-yarder, and you're going to make every point after touchdown, and that's that's really nice to see, and I think our players really enjoy watching it too. How much do you guys work on special teams? you work on special teams more than maybe the average Division One college football team? I, I don't know what everybody does. Uh, we, we spend uh, 30 minutes a day. Uh, on Thursday, we spend uh, probably 40 minutes. On Tuesday and Wednesday, we spend about 30 minutes, um, and then we practice on Sundays, and Sundays we don't spend too much time on special teams, but they're they're one-third of our practice because I was always told they're one-third of the game. Well, I would uh, definitely agree with that, and I think uh, the the change of field position, and that was another area where I thought you guys really did a a nice job. You were able to uh, really turn the, uh, the field position on them in that ball game. Well, I think that was two reasons. I think our offense consistently got first downs. Uh, they kept the clock running. And then I, I thought the kickers did a nice job putting the ball where it's supposed to be put. And then the coverage teams for two weeks in a row have really done a nice job. Well, and again, I think that comes back 
to recruiting guys that can run and guys that like to hit. And, again, when you recruit all these athletes like you've been fortunate enough to, to garner up here the last three or four years, it's going to pay big dividends on those special teams. What's interesting is, is all those young guys we were talking about earlier, about how athletic they are, how long they are. They've got good speed. And a lot of them are on our special teams. And so there's going to be a time one or two of them are going to make a mistake. But what they do is they're energetic. They love to play, and that's their chance to play. So they play with great enthusiasm. You know, I wanted to ask you just a, kind of a, an off-the-wall question here. We saw June Jones, uh, who we know pretty well from his days here in San Diego, uh, working as a coach and, and knew him when he was over in Hawaii. He abruptly resigned after two games. His team was really kind of getting boat raced off the field. Not, and there were obviously some uh, issues maybe uh, in his family that he needed to take care of. But Eric Dickerson came out today and said, you know, if, if SMU's not going to do it right, they might as well just uh, – shut it down and be a basketball school and go from there. They keep crying about the death penalty 30 years ago. And, you know, you go, he's not getting any help. And you look at TCU on the other side of the street there and, and they're, uh, you know, flourishing and, and they've got their program up and running. From your standpoint, and you were at New Mexico, you've been at San Diego State, and you know what some of these other programs uh, dole out money-wise. What kind of money does it really take to, to run, a, uh, say, an Ohio State or a Michigan or uh, that type of program? Well, I, I don't know if the, the question is what it takes to run them. It's, it's what they have to spend. Uh, and so when you have an enormous amount of money to spend on a program, uh, you you have a lot better chance of doing things the right way that will improve the performance of your team, uh, number one, by getting better players there because of the attraction of the place. Uh, number two, they're fed well, they're trained well, um, differently than the schools that don't have those resources. Um, but they also bring an enormous amount of money in, too. We we were we were told the other day that uh, the new Big 12 TV contract, which includes TCU now, is going to pay them 32 million dollars per team this year in TV revenue. Hmm. Where our league, the Mountain West Conference, plays pays each team TV revenue is 1.4 million dollars. Okay, so if they want to feed their guys, since the rules are changing in the Power Five, so to speak. Uh, is basically able to do what they want, and we can do the same thing if we can afford it. They can feed their kids more often. Uh, their locker rooms are nicer. Their practice fields are nicer. Um, when they recruit them, they can put on the uh, what they show them might be a little fancier, a little brighter. The stars shine. I, I, I don't know. I, you know, I, I think that's overblown a bit, and I think that. Coaches can get frustrated with that if you allow it to frustrate you. But my my opinion is is that kids are the same, and we're probably not going to get some of the five- or four-star guys because of that. But we're going to get a bunch of great kids, and we're going to get some really good athletes. And then it's all about them wanting to and us coaching them right, and let's go out and compete. And, I mean, I, we just did it. North, North Carolina, we didn't beat them, and we should have, but we didn't beat them. But North Carolina probably has three times the football budget that we have. And so good for them. But I think coaches get frustrated with that sometimes, and it bothers them so much that they don't think they can compete. That's not the case here. We think we can. Okay. You you might be in the uh, minority with that uh, thought right there. You talked about coaches getting, you know, upset and frustrated. Let me ask you just as an overall conference. How, how does the Mountain West Conference, uh, year in and year out, how are they going to compete with uh, some of these so-called power conferences going forward if these uh, schools and conferences are getting that kind of money year in and year out? Well, you, you can't compete with them uh, with facilities. Um, you know, you can't, you can't compete on a certain level. How you can compete, in my opinion – is there's a lot of good, potentially good football players out there. So if, as a coaching staff, you do a good job of evaluating, they might not be considered the cream of the crop when they're coming out of high school, but you evaluate them such that you know in two or three years 
they're going to be as good as those other guys that were five-star guys to begin with. And then if you coach them right and treat them right and they have the right attitude about them, you, you get a team that can compete. And I think in the Mountain West Conference, it could be a different team each year or it could be a team for three or four years and then a different team for three or four years. I mean, I, I think Fresno State, even though they didn't play well at the very end, Fresno State could have played against anybody last year and competed. Boise State has done that in the past. Utah did that when they were in the Mountain West Conference. TCU did that when they were in the Mountain West Conference and went to the Rose Bowl. And Boise State went to the Fiesta Bowl. And Utah beat Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. So what you're going to have is teams in our conference when all everything fits just right. you got enough talent. The atmosphere is right. The team works right. You get on a roll, and then you can play against those guys. Now, our trick here, I think, at San Diego State is to keep that pretty consistent, where we fight every year for the conference championship, and every once in a while we have the perfect ingredients with players and attitude, and then we go and do something special. Heck, Coach, uh, you're just telling me about this on a Wednesday night. I can only imagine what you tell your players on Saturday before you take the field. I'm ready to bust the studio doors down right now. Well, (laughs) I don't know if it affects you know I don't know if it affects our players the same way, but we don't we don't take anybody in our program that doesn't think they can play with those guys. Uh, we don't we don't take anybody in our program that doesn't want to be an NFL football player. Now we won't take somebody in our program that says they want to come to school here because it's in San Diego, even though San Diego is really nice and that's an added benefit. We want guys that want to be ball players first. We're going to take a timeout. More to come on the Rocky Long Show right here on ESPN. 1700. Well, the Aztecs' next game will be uh, a week from this Saturday, September 20th at Reeser Stadium. They'll go against Oregon State, and you want to do game day right? Do it with the latest innovations from LG. From the kitchen to the living room, LG has you covered. Come check out the latest in LG innovations. If your local Best Buy, you can check them out online at bestbuy.com forward slash LG. It's all possible with LG. Coach, uh, how are you attacking uh, this bye week, and do you like the bye week this early in the season? <laughs> I, uh, I think I've told you before I have no control over the scheduling because mm-hmm. if I did, I would have it uh, worked out differently than it is. But I do believe uh, that the bye week is a, at a good point right now because I don't, I, I don't believe that the game, when you travel back east for four or five hours or you travel to Hawaii for – four or five hours to play a game, I I don't really think it affects the game that you're playing. Mm -hmm. What I think it affects is the next game you play because you go out there and we played at 8 o'clock. We got on a plane about 2 o'clock in the morning their time. We flew back here. We got back to the offices about 5 o'clock in the morning our time in San Diego. So what it does is put you a day behind. I mean, you can either – keep your kids up and go practice or you can let them go home and rest and you you miss one day of practice or one day of preparation it puts the coaches one day behind uh in the preparation for the next game so i think the bye week came at a great time now i was hoping that oregon state didn't have a bye because they played in hawaii right but they had a bye too so there's no advantage either way but uh uh you know if you had it perfect your bye week would be right in the middle yeah, amen to that. Coach, uh, how are you attacking uh, practice this week? Uh, we went Tuesday and had a pretty good practice. We had a really long, hard practice today. We'll have a long, hard practice tomorrow. We'll give them Friday and Saturday off. We'll come back on Sunday and start game preparation for Oregon State. Now, l- let me make sure I'm on the board. I-, I-, I was in the impression that you guys scrimmage a little bit yesterday, and are you planning on scrimmaging a little bit tomorrow again? Yeah, we, we scrimmaged the last 15 minutes of practice uh, yesterday with all the young guys that were trying to redshirt and all the young guys that are in backup roles uh, that haven't played much in any games yet because you never know when they're going to have to play. And so we scrimmaged for 15 minutes yesterday. We'll scrimmage for 15 minutes at the end of practice tomorrow. Um, you know, we, we're trying to get all those guys, our, our two freshman quarterbacks. Uh, we don't hit them in these scrimmages. Everybody else is live, but the quarterbacks aren't live. Uh, but they're taking all the reps. You know, we don't want Quinn to get hurt. and uh, We need him to play well, and we need him to stay healthy. 
but that's the only chance that those quarterbacks are going to see live bodies flying around. And so it gives them some experience. And if we have to use them, then they've seen some live action. And we've got a lot of young linebackers and DBs that need to work. We've got some young running backs. Marcus Stamps is playing in the scrimmage because he got hurt in training camp and hasn't been 100%. He's 100% now, but he hadn't carried the ball where he actually got hit until yesterday. Well, these El Ruffin are uh, going to be out now for uh, six to eight weeks. And we talked about Larry Clark, uh, uh, and you talked about, you know, kind of his inexperience and, you know, maybe not running the routes he's supposed to. How important are th- this week and next week for him to get those extra reps? Well, I, I think it's really important, and I think we're going to use a couple other wide receivers that haven't played much. Uh, Paul Pitts is going to do some uh, – uh, you know, we're using Eric Judge. He'll be in different spots. Jamon Hazley. Um, we got a freshman that might play, um, Micah Holder from Oceanside. Mm-hmm. Uh, all those guys will get better as they go, but they better get better quick. <laughs> um, Oregon State's a good football team. I actually think they're a better football team than North Carolina. I don't think they have quite the speed North Carolina has or the athleticism, but I think they're a better football team. But after that, which is much more important to us, we start league play, and we play UNLV after the Oregon State game, and UNLV beat us up pretty good last year, so uh, we got to get started off on the right right foot in conference play. We'll take a, a quick time out. More to come with uh, Coach Rocky Long right here on ESPN 1700. John Cantero with you, uh, host of the Coach Rocky Long Show each and every week here on ESPN 1700. Again, next week, uh, no show leading up to the Oregon State game. Uh, the following week, we'll be back here on ESPN 1700. That'll be on September 24th from 7 to 8. And our first show on the Mighty 1090 will be on October 1st. want to get to our California Bank and Trust Student Athlete of the Week, and we certainly thank California Bank and Trust for recognizing these great San Diego State athletes. This week's Outstanding Student Athlete on behalf of California Bank and Trust is uh, David Olson, men's soccer player, this past Sunday, SDSU's men's soccer team defeated number 19-ranked Denver 4-3, to winning the courtyard by Marriott San Diego Central Aztec soccer title. The victory pushes the Aztecs' current win streak to three games. Olsen scored two game-winning goals during the weekend and was named the tournament's most outstanding player. Against Denver, Olsen scored the Aztecs' first goal of the match, coming off an assist by freshman Mark Ravel. Olsen was able to find the net a second time off a cross by sophomore uh, Fora Bice. Uh, or Bass, excuse me, setting up Olson's game-winning goal. Olson's a freshman majoring in business administration. Congratulations to David Olson, this week's California Bank and Trust Student Athlete of the Week. And, you know, Coach, we I know we talked last uh, week or a couple weeks ago about a young lady winning that award, and uh, you get an opportunity. You're a sports guy. You like going to sporting events, but this time of the year you're kind of tied up. But, you know, it's really amazing. Throughout the course of the year I get these emails from the uh, Aztec Tech Athletic Department, and boy, some of the the athletes are really doing some great things. Not only you know within the conference, but on the national level as well. I, I, it's surprising to me because I've never been around an athletic department that has the kind of success that this one's having. You know, our basketball program is unbelievable, and uh, they get a lot of notoriety because of it. But uh, in the last two years, their the teams on this campus have won 18 conference championships. And then we've had some people playing, a lot of people playing postseason play. We've had some individuals win national championships, like our girl that's a triple jumper in track. I mean, it, it's unbelievable what's going on here. And, and I don't know how many people know, but Aztec fans and Aztec alumni ought to be pretty proud of it. Hey, let me ask you this, and I realize there's a Title IX situation uh, to, you know, maybe add in a men's sport, and that's probably not even in the, the hemisphere right now on Jim Sturk's table, but would it benefit Aztec football to have an Aztec men's track team once again? Well, I, I think it would. Uh, to a point, it would help. It would help in recruiting with those guys that run fast and want to compete in both sports. Uh, but th- there's still that possibility uh, since we have a track team. I know it's a women's track team, but since we have a track team, uh, we could have players on our team go and compete unattached. So it's not like if we have a great trackster on our football team, it's not like he's left out in the cold. Uh, 
Um, but obviously they would like to compete with the team. But I'm with you. The, the Title IX situation probably makes that an impossibility. All right, let's talk uh, about Oregon State uh, by this week. They nearly uh, escaped, uh, kind of melting down there in the fourth quarter, giving up 23 fourth quarter points, but they ended up winning the ball game 38 to 30. Uh, they won their opener against Portland State at Research Stadium, and they've got their great senior quarterback coming back, Sean Mannion, who I thought at once upon a time in the middle of last year, I thought he would probably be going to the NFL. Well, I, I thought he was too, and I was hoping he would. <laughs> <laughs> I, I heard you wrote a nice letter of recommendation. Yeah, everybody that came by here, all the pro scouts that came by to check our guys out, I told them that the guy at Oregon State was really, really good and they should get him. But, uh, no, he's back, and he's a good player. Uh, he's got a couple good receivers and a couple good running backs, and they're big up front like all those Pac-12 teams are. It, it'll be a good game. And like I said earlier, uh, Oregon State, I think, is a little bit better team than North Carolina. They're not quite as fast. They're not quite as athletic. But they're bigger and they're stronger, and they run an offense that allows them to be that way. They run the ball at you. They use play-action pass. They have one guy that's really, really fast on the outside, and it's hard to get pressure on the quarterback when he does play-action pass or they run the ball well. So we're going to have to play really good coverage because we're going to have to keep a bunch of guys near the line of scrimmage that control the running game. Yeah, because they've got a couple of pretty good backs, don't they? They they do. The guy that played against us last year, and they've got one – that's come to his own. Uh, that I think they're averaging almost six yards a carry right now in their first two games. We'll uh, take our final time out. We'll come back. We'll uh, wrap it up with Coach Long, and uh, we'll uh, set the stage for uh, coming up here uh, shortly. Uh, boy, you think you got all the time in the world, but that game comes around rather quickly. Again, the Aztecs' next game going to be at Reeser Stadium up in Corvallis on September 20th against Oregon State. One more segment to go. Stay with us on the Coach Rocky Long Show right here on ESPN 1700. As we get to our final segment tonight on the Coach Rocky Long Show, again, I want to remind everyone, you can go to GoAztecs.com for tickets for the conference opener coming up on Saturday, or Saturday, September 27th at Qualcomm Stadium. That'll be the Aztecs' next home game. And again, there's not been a time um, released on that uh, ball game, but like Coach Long said uh, last uh, year, UNLV did a, a great job of taking down the Aztecs over there. The Aztecs definitely uh, planning on returning the favor this year. And then uh, no game this coming Saturday, the Aztec bye week. And then next Saturday, September 20th at Reeser Stadium to take on the 2-0 and Oregon State Beavers. Uh, Coach, uh, we talked last week uh, a lot about recruiting. And now uh, your guys, uh, your coaching staff, uh, they'll go out and do a little recruiting here this weekend? They will. They'll be out uh, all day Friday and visiting high schools and then go to a couple games uh, Friday night. Uh, they'll go see some junior college and some high school games on Saturday, and then they'll be back in the office on Sunday. How much do you guys recruit uh, junior college now? Uh, we investigate all of them in case there's an unbelievable player out there that we might get that could make us a, you know, be an impact guy for us and make us a better football team. But we, what we do is we look at our roster and look where we might need an older, more mature guy that has a chance to start in a position, and we recruit only if we need a position. All right. Uh, now, is the head coach allowed to go out and watch a high school football game on a Friday night? Well, it is. We have we have so many evaluation days in the fall, and I, I think I'm going to go up and watch uh, Oceanside play Chaparral on Friday night. That's probably a pretty good game to take in. Well, I, Oceanside's got some good players, and I really like Coach Carroll, and Chaparral's got a couple good players, too. There'll be several players in the game I want to see. I'm sure there will be. Uh, to get a, a Division One head coach out to a Friday night football game, got to have some talent there. You can't waste your time just uh, going to watch anybody. Well, I love high school football, so... Um, just because they have players, that just makes it a uh, reason to go. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Coach, have a, a great uh, week of preparation. I, I'm sorry we're not uh, going to be on with the show next week, but the following week we'll we'll uh, hopefully uh, talk about a big Aztec win and get ready for the conference opener. I pretty sure appreciate it, Coach. Thanks a lot. Be well, Coach.
There you go. Head coach Rocky Long. Always enjoy uh, being a part of the Rocky Long Show. What a class guy. I mean, he's one of my favorite guys uh, really all time in this broadcasting business. I've been at this for 25 years here in San Diego, and he really and truly is one of my favorite guys that I've ever uh, come across. I, I just really think he does a great job of really understanding what collegiate athletics is all about. Hope you enjoyed the show. Again, uh, Next week we'll be off, but we'll be back at it on September 24th from 7 to 8 with the Rocky Long Show. And then the following week, once the Padres are over, on October 1st, that'll be a Wednesday night, we will be coming on with uh, my regular show, and then it'll be the Rocky Long Show from 7 to 8. Until uh, then, Coach John Cantera, go Aztecs. <laughs>